Hello, everyone. Good evening. You guys made it through all the six or five different casinos and found your way here, so which is good. Last session of the day, I hope. So thank you for being here. I know it's late evening uh, in Vegas, and everybody is getting ready for uh, if this you guys... session. I'm getting ready for this session. <laughs> I was about to say the Monday li Live uh, keynote with Peter DeSantis this evening. Uh, it's, it'll be an interesting one. Uh, lots of good announcements coming. I'm not allowed to say anything more than that. Uh, so thank you. And uh, welcome. My name is Arthi, and I'm a partner solutions architect with AWS. For the past two years, or two and a half years, focused on the VMware Cloud on AWS offering. Joining me today, two amazing people, my partner in crime. I'll let Wen and Choban introduce themselves. All right. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Wen Yu. I'm a partner SA with AWS. I'm 100% dedicated to our good partner, VMware, for this VMware Cloud and AWS service. And I was told by a friend, Ken, an audio expert back there, this is the last session for this room. So we'll stay here for as long as you want for questions, uh, more demos, whatever your heart desires. We'll be here until the next morning. <laughs> All right? With that, I want to introduce my uh, other partner in crime from the other side. Uh, go ahead, Shoban. Thank you, guys. Uh, my name is Shoban Lakapragada. I'm from VMware, I'm from the storage and availability product management team. I've uh, been with VMware for about six years, working now very closely with Ven and Arthi on this amazing partnership that we have between VMware on AWS. Uh, my background's more on data protection and storage, right? So yeah, we're here to talk about uh, you know, vSAN and Elastic vSAN. Thank you, right. guys. Okay. We'll be back. So just a bit of background. So I joined AWS six years back, and the reason I wanted to bring that up is uh, rewind back to the reInvent 2012 or 2013. How many sessions do you think we had with VMware? Zero. Uh, and prior to working on VMware Cloud on AWS, I was helping some of our enterprise customers in the West Coast build network architectures using AWS. And in a lot of these conversations that I have with these customers, uh, there are a few things that come up consistently. They want to have a purely hybrid cloud design because there are some applications that are well-suited to run on-prem. Not everything is maybe suitable for the cloud. There are applications that are suitable for the cloud. So there was not a clean way of doing hybrid cloud back in 2012-13. They also wanted to lift and shift. Every company, if you talk to, has a cloud mandate policy. Everybody wants to move to the cloud, but they don't know how to do it, or they don't have the time to do it. They want this lift and shift migration where they keep their operational skills and tool sets consistent with what they already know. If I go say somebody from uh, VMware, hey, go ahead and learn all the AWS services, it's going to take some time, and it's reInvent, right? Even for our solutions architects, after reInvent is like our test time. It takes a lot of time for us to compile through all the new services that gets launched at reInvent. So as we started talking to these customers, it became evident that there was not a clean way we helped customers to do a hybrid cloud design and with the same uh, operational skill sets that they have. So what we did is two, two and a half years back, we partnered with VMware. We said, okay, let's partner together, build something that our customers want and help them with their migration efforts or with their hybrid cloud design. So the goal of today's session, fast forward to reInvent 2018, I think there's like 15 to 20 sessions on the catalog today with VMware Cloud on AWS. And what we're gonna to do today is we're not gonna do a basic VMware Cloud. I'm sure everybody is already familiar. Uh, show of hands, who uses the service today or in the process of getting into the service today? Perfect. So um, I'm hoping like the 101 is already covered. So we wanna do a deep dive. This is a 300 level session. So we'll start with three core areas that are important, networking, storage, and data protection. And the reason we chose this is all three are very tightly coupled with each other. How many of you are customers in the room? And partners? It's a lot of partners. I work for the partner team, so. When we talk to customers, some of the very common questions that we hear, and this is not limited to what you see here, there's more, but more frequent questions that we hear from customers are, my data center is out of capacity. I wanna get out of my data center. 
what do I do? I want to do DR. I want to have my data center as it is, but I don't want to go build a new environment for DR purposes. How do I do it? I want to migrate certain workloads, and our favorite workload is up there. My favorite workload is up there. I want to migrate Oracle workloads. I want to also do data protection for these workloads. How do I do this? And from the partner side, some of the common questions we hear is, hey, you guys went ahead and launched VMware Cloud on AWS offering. You guys are best buddies now, AWS and VMware. How do we make use of VMware Cloud on AWS to our customers? How do we provide design architectures for our customers? There's a lot of abbreviations up there, right? There's vSAN, there's i3, there's EBS, DX, HCX. You guys come up with new abbreviations every day. Help us understand what these are and how our customers, we can help our customers use these services. How do we use site recovery? How do we use like DataGuard, LiveV Motion, or S3, other native AWS services? So what we wanted to do is there's three of us, there's three topics. So figure out who's doing what. We wanted to help you guys understand these three topics to a 300 level so you can go back and start building out your cloud services with VMware Cloud on AWS or help your customers build these out. I said I won't get into the 101, but I just wanted to start with the overview here. So VMware Cloud on AWS, for folks that are new, it's delivered as a cloud offering, it's completely sold and operated by VMware. So what is it? So this is not nested virtualization. We're not taking ESXi and installing it on EC2 host here. So this is running directly on Amazon's bare metal infrastructure. So if you've seen Jeff Barr's blog post recently, we just announced a couple of bare metal instances. i3 is one of the families. R5 is one of the families. So ESXi runs directly on top of these bare metal instances. It's not just ESXi that is delivered to you. It comes as a solution package. So you have your vSphere environment. You have vSAN. You have NSX that is all packaged together and is delivered as a cloud service offering to you. Think about it, right? If I want to deploy a VMware Cloud on AWS environment today, so the minimum host size is three nodes today, and it takes approximately 90 minutes to uh, 100 minutes to get this full package solution deployed. How long do you think that takes if you want to deploy it on-prem from all your Excel sheet work of figuring out how much capacity you need to getting all the approvals to racking and stacking your servers? It's considerable time difference. So customers could just spin up a VMware Cloud on AWS environment. And we also have customers testing out the one node cluster. So VMware introduced a single node cluster recently just for development and testing purposes or for partners uh, who are in the technology space to validate their solutions. So the benefit of VMware Cloud on AWS is a couple of things. We want to have operational consistency with what's running on-prem. So VMware introduced vCenter with hybrid link mode. What that allows you to do is extend your vCenter across your on-prem and the VMware Cloud on AWS SDDC. So what this lets you do is allows you to see both your vSphere environments that you're running on-prem and what you're running in the cloud in a single pane of glass. Because we don't want you to be switching between different windows if you're operating across the same environments. And when has a nice demo planned at the end? Hopefully the demo guards are in our favor to showcase that to you. We also wanted our customers to make use of native AWS services that's available to them. Because as we talk to customers who are AWS and VMware customers, they're like, yeah, I have stuff running inside my AWS account. I have S3 buckets with a lot of data in it. I have EC2 instances. How do we make these two work together? So what we did is we jointly engineered with VMware to provide a low latency, high bandwidth network connection between their VMware Cloud and AWS software defined data center and their VPC or S3 or any AWS services that you might see. With that, let's jump into what I'm passionate about. So I'm gonna be covering networking here. A common question that we hear from customers is, what are some of the minimum requirements to migrate my workloads without any downtime? The without any downtime is critical. We don't wanna shut down our VMs. We have ways to do it today. We want a live vMotion that will help us migrate to the VMware Cloud on AWS SCDC in a seamless fashion. And partners want to help their customers do this, but they also wanna understand how they can design this architecture with NSX, with AWS Direct Connect, and with hybrid cloud extension. So that's what we're gonna see now. 
When we launched the service a year and a half back, the NSX that came as part of the service was called NSX V. So let's see how it differs and what's making it, uh, what updates we are making in the recent times. So you have your customer data center on the left-hand side, and then I have my VMware Cloud and AWS SCDC on the right. So you see there are two boxes here. One is my logical network, the green one. So this is gonna be your overlay networks that you create to run your application workloads in. AWS doesn't natively do overlay networks, so we don't care. We don't know what you're running there. All we know is the VPC CIDR block. So you could create any number of logical networks there. And then you have your management network that is used for your NSX manager or vCenter appliance. All your management traffic is within that box that you see there. There's also VM kernel networks that is used when you're doing vMotion. So we have all these three boxes here. How do we connect into these? The, log the logical networks have a construct called a compute gateway, which is nothing but an NSX edge that runs on the ESXi host. And similarly, the management gateway is for the management traffic. So the sole purpose of these gateways is any traffic that is coming to your application workload VM, it will use the compute gateway, and any traffic to the management network will use the management gateway. So if I want to connect into these, how do I do it? I could simply establish an IPsec VPN connection from my on-prem firewall that I have. It is not recommend, it is not a requirement to have NSX on-prem. So I could establish an IPsec connection from my on-prem into the compute gateway and the management gateway. So I have now two VPN connections, which is okay. But most of our enterprise customers already make use of AWS Direct Connect. So Direct Connect provides customers either a one gig or a 10 gig link so that you get this consistent network bandwidth. So how do I make use of Direct Connect? Because especially if I'm vMotioning my workload VMs from my on-prem into the cloud, I wanna make sure there's consistent network performance. And vMotion, as you know, has a latency requirement of somewhere less than 180 milliseconds. So for, direct, for vMotion, I could use the Direct Connect, establish a private virtual interface into the VMware Cloud on AWS SDDC, and have my workload VMs moved over. This is okay, but what VMware did in the latest release is launched a newer version of NSX called NSXT. And what's changed with NSXT is this diagram still stays same as what we saw. We have the uh, compute gateway, we have the management gateway. But they've introduced a logical construct of the NSX called NSXT0 router. So all your VPN terminations that we talked about will be into this NSX T0 router. So it now simplifies from two VPN connections into a single VPN connection. So the NSX T0 router then has what we call interfaces, like virtual interfaces that knows how to communicate into the compute gateway and management gateway. We call it a tier zero router, the green box that you see there, and the blue ones are our tier one routers. It comes with additional features and functionalities. One is BGP support. The earlier version of NSX, uh, we could only do static VPN connections. So with NSXT, you're able to support uh, dynamic VPN connections with BGP. This was one of the most uh, asked features, at least from last VM world that we went. Distributed firewalling was something most customers wanted because they're using it on-prem and they wanted to have consistency as well. So distributed firewalling is supported with this version of NSXT. The third one is DPDK support. So there's been improvements on the driver, so the performance of NSXT is much better when you compare it to the performance of NSXV. And the last one is you're able to carry your security groups across your on-prem and VMware Cloud on AWS environment. We saw in the previous slide that for vMotion, we used Direct Connect. But one thing that came from our customers is, hey, we don't like managing VPN connections. We want to completely get rid of VPN. Can we just use AWS Direct Connect natively? And that's what we did. So we recently launched a feature that will allow customers to just use a private hosted WIF into the VMware Cloud on AWS SDDC. What we do is, in the background, what we've engineered together is we propagate by natively, if you know how Direct Connect works, VPC only propagates whatever is the VPC CIDR block. It doesn't propagate any other networks back to on-prem using BGP. 
So what we've done is we've made changes to our uh, infrastructure, the way that we propagate routes. So now, when you have a direct connect with a private hosted WIF, you can now propagate any overlay networks that you add in your VMware Cloud on AWS SCDC back to your on-prem environment. So this simplifies the network connectivity, and it also gives you a consistent performance when you're trying to vMotion over your workloads from your on-prem to the cloud, or even vice versa. So if you're thinking about live vMotion, right? I have an application, web application, that I'm running on-prem, and I want to migrate it to my VMware Cloud on AWS environment. So it's pretty simple. You establish an AWS Direct Connect. You make sure you've got NSXT, and you're not on the older version of NSXV. And then you make sure you create a private hosted WIF. Excuse me. And all it does is it makes sure it propagates the compute networks and the logical networks using BGP to the other side. And then if you want to have that single pane of glass that we talked about, use the hybrid link mode. And then the vMotion operation is pretty consistent. You go into your vSphere console, you right click, you vMotion, you both your compute and storage is moved on. You select what the destination network is. And if you don't want to have an IP change, like I have VMs that I'm running on-prem, and I want to move it to the cloud, and I don't want to change my IP address, which is a fairly common request, you extend your layer two network. So you create a stretch layer two network between your on-prem environment that allows you to stretch your layer two. So in that case, when you move a VM from one environment into the other, you don't have to go through the process of re-IPing your VM. WeMotion works, it's great, but what about bulk we, uh, migration of VMs? We've had customers who wanted to migrate like 600, 800 VMs in the past few weeks. And what VMware has helped us with this is there's a new, uh, there's a feature called hybrid cloud extension. It's included as part of the service. You don't pay any additional cost for hybrid cloud extension. What hybrid cloud extension does is it acts as an abstraction layer between your vSphere environments. So instead of now you setting up this layer two VPN extended network between on-prem and the VMware cloud, you deploy an OVA file and deploy the hybrid cloud uh, extension gateway on both sides. Once the gateway is deployed on both sides, you'll see, the, you'll see something in your vSphere called HCX VMs on both sides. It sets up the auto uh, VPN between both these environments. And what's good about this is, one, it reduces your time to go through the process of setting up your stretch network. Two, it doesn't require DX. It can work natively with your WAN link. Just be sure um, you enable WAN optimization that comes along with the HCX uh, hybrid cloud extension. The other thing is it uses vSphere replication, which you're already familiar. So it's not something fancy. So you have proxy VMs on both sides. Your VMs data proxy to the other side. And when you think it's the right time to switch over, your data is available on the other side ready for you. This is an interesting slide. How many of you use Oracle Rack on-prem today? Uh, I'm smiling because every conversation I have with people who use Oracle, more than the technical requirements, it comes down to licensing. The first question I get asked is, how are you guys handling licensing? And I'm like, sorry. Um, I'm not the licensing expert here, but natively, Oracle Rack's licensing is not is not something we comment on. So what we did recently is, especially with, for Rack solution on VMware Cloud and AWS, we partnered with House of Bricks, who's a good partner and specializes in Oracle licensing, and we published a general white paper because every customer has different agreements with Oracle depending on the number of cores and hypervisors, uh, hyperthreading that they do. So uh, if there's specific licensing questions, feel free to reach out to us and we can loop you in with the right people. But there are a few technical challenges of running an Oracle Rack environment in AWS today. Rack, for example, requires a multicast network, and AWS natively today does not support multicast. And so if you, uh, there's ways of doing multicast, like creating an overlay on top of EC2 and doing GRE tunneling, which is not, it's crappy. It's like nobody wants to do it. And uh, the second technical blocker with like running Rack is it requires shared storage. The solutions that we offer today, like EBS, for example, it's not shared storage, right? So how do we do this uh, on AWS? And VMware was a perfect answer for us. 
Because VMware runs on our bare metal instances and they create overlay networks on top of our in infrastructure, we don't care about it. So they are at the flexibility of running multicast on these overlay networks. And then vSAN helps with the shared storage solution. With i3 Metal, and Shobhan will talk in detail about some of the storage concepts. But with i3 Metal, vSAN aggregates all the instance storage from all the hosts and creates an abstraction layer. So what customers could do when they're thinking about migrating large Oracle rack databases into the cloud is use RMAN backup and then back it up to an S3 bucket that they own and then spin up a VMware cloud on AWS cluster. So once the VMware cloud on AWS cluster is up and running, restore the RMAN, restore your backups from this S3 bucket into, uh, you have your VMs up and running and then you create your standby databases. So if you see my primary is still on my on-prem environment and I have the standby that I've created on VMware Cloud and AWS. And then you start your managed recovery. So this is when you'll use DataGuard and then ship your redo logs to the standby databases. And once that's done, and once you have the markers set, you can now switch, make a switch over. Keynote, it's not a failover, it's a switch over. So you make a database switch over from your on-prem into the VMware Cloud on AWS. So our STDC now becomes a primary database and my on-prem becomes the uh, standby database. Optionally, what you could do is if you still want to keep both in sync, you start your managed recovery in the other direction. So now you have DataGuard that syncs between your primary database running inside the STDC into the uh, customer on-prem database. Additionally, if RMAN backups doesn't work for you, you could also use EFS or storage gateway, especially the file gateway, mount it to your database that you run on-prem, back up the data, and then restore using these uh, EFS and storage file gateways. So we kind of covered the design architectures of how you should be doing networking, like use TX, use HCX for bulk migration, and uh, make sure that when you're migrating workloads, if you're doing vMotion, Direct Connect is a requirement. With HCX, Direct Connect is not a requirement because it's got WAN optimization built into it. With that said, we have a lot to cover on the storage side, especially with new features that we've launched recently. And for that, who better to cover than Shobin? Thank you. Thank you, Arthi. So in this section, um, I'll double click on the storage capabilities that are available in VMware Cloud on AWS. So from the time we launched this service uh, more than a year ago, right, a lot of customers wanted to know um, what uh, new things that we're doing in the storage space. And for partners, you know, the one question that keeps coming up is uh, they've heard about this new capability that uh, we're calling Elastic vSAN, which we announced in VMworld of this year. And a lot of partners want to know, uh, and customers also, when do I use um, I3-based vSAN versus this Elastic vSAN, right? So that's what I want to cover in this section. So when it comes to storage, the first capability that's available, the first option is um, um, uh, VMware vSAN running on uh, Amazon i3, right? By, um, by the way, how many of you are familiar with vSAN, at least to some extent? Okay, okay. So many of you are. So vSAN, you know, just a one minute summary. It's uh, part of our hyperconverged infrastructure solution. It's the scale out storage that pulls together the local embedded disks, right, or storage of the hosts and present a uh, distributed storage. So when we uh, did VMware Cloud on AWS, vSAN is the storage offering as part of the SDDC stack. So the first choice here, uh, vSAN pulls together all the local NVMe uh, devices of i3. Uh, this is what we launched the service with. Um, and you don't really have to be a storage expert to manage vSAN, right? Um, all the storage attributes, like uh, whether you want to enable mirroring or erasure coding, right? Uh, RAID 5, RAID 6, uh, all those things can be managed very simply by using uh, VMware storage policy based management, right? So, um, and it's deeply integrated with the VMware stack. Um, vSAN works um, with many of the backup solutions out there um, for uh, you know, uh, taking backups of the VMs deployed. Uh, and that's the same framework, whether it's on-premises or in the cloud. Um, we do have uh, deduplication and compression uh, enabled in this type of cluster. 
So you do get that additional um, storage capacity uh, uh, benefits, right, with that capability. Um, we have data at rest encryption as well. Um, I'll, I do have another slide which um, I'll talk about in more detail. Um, so this is the solution that's been out for some time. Um, the new capability that we uh, uh, have announced and it's in preview right now is what we're calling Elastic vSAN, where vSAN um, is now running, or the whole VMC, VMware Cloud and AWS software is running on Amazon's new diskless instances, the R5 instances. Um, and for both the caching tier and the capacity tier of vSAN, we're leveraging uh, GP2 EBS volumes, right? Um, and this solution brings a lot of benefits um, um, from not only you know, capacity perspective, but also uh, to be able to deal with failures, right, uh, that I'll talk about. So the real motivation for us in enabling this solution is you know, for a lot of customers and a lot of workloads, their storage needs are growing much faster than compute needs, right? Um, and that's um, you know, the primary uh, reason for us to build this uh, capability. Uh, this is available in um, per host capacities of 15 terabytes to 35 terabytes. You can choose um, in increments of five terabytes, so 15, 20, and so on. Um, in the initial preview phase, we do have a limitation that this type of cluster cannot be your only cluster. Uh, that's just a short-term limitation that's going to go away in future. Um, so in, currently, um, in preview, you can add this as a second VMware Cloud and AWS cluster, right? Uh, you still have to have your i3-based uh, clusters. So let's uh, dive into this. Um, in this configuration of Elastic vSAN with EBS, we have three disk groups. Um, for those of you who are familiar with vSAN, uh, you know, vSAN this, uh, has this concept of disk group. In the i3 version, we have two disk groups. This one has three disk groups. Um, and we are leveraging EBS volumes for both the cache and capacity tier, as I mentioned. Um, um, uh, and for this solution, um, we have compression enabled, uh, no dedupe. Um, but you know, with the compression, you do get, not only do you get um, higher storage density, but you know, with compression, you can also get that additional savings. Um, as I mentioned, you, know, you can add or choose uh, capacity in increments of five terabytes. Um, up to 35 TB, right? When it comes to dealing with failures, this Elastic vSAN also has the benefit that all your data is sitting on EBS. So if there's a host uh, failure, let's say, right? Um, the VMware Cloud and AWS software that's constantly monitoring the health of the cluster detects that there's a host uh, issue and um, it uh, you know, adds a host uh, automatically. Um, and the EBS volumes are then moved to the newly provisioned host, right? Um, and uh, you know, once this process is completed, the ho old host is removed from the cluster, and the new host with that uh, you know, data is uh, added back into the cluster. So this drastically reduces the amount of rebuilds we have to do. There's still gonna be some amount of rebuilding and resyncing that needs to happen. Uh, but this is, um, um, you know, not only does this solution help with capacity, but also with these kind of failure scenarios. Um, similarly, if there's a disk or disk group failure, um, the software will identify that, uh, you know, a, there's a particular disk group that failed. That particular disk group will be removed, and new EBS volumes will be uh, added, right, uh, to that disk group to replace that failed disk group. Um, and there will be some data uh, that needs to be rebuilt and resynced, right? Um, as I mentioned before, uh, vSAN um, in the cloud, in VMware Cloud and AWS, both the i3 version as well as this elastic vSAN with EBS, um, supports data at rest encryption by integrating with uh, Amazon Key Management Server. Um, as customers, you do have the ability to do uh, shallow rekeying, right? Um, so that's something that we do support. Both the boot device as well as um, the, the caching and capacity tier, they're all encrypted with this uh, solution. Uh, the last thing that I want to mention is um, um, stretch clusters. Um, you know, with uh, vSAN in VMware Cloud and AWS, you have the option of doing a stretch cluster across two availability zones. Uh, with this capability, you know, you can get um, the benefits of synchronous replication. All your data is kept in sync across the two AZs. 
And if they were, uh, you know, it doesn't happen often, but if there was an AZ failure, VMware HA will kick in and the VMs will be automatically restarted, right, on the other side. Um, and even in the steady state, uh, DRS will vMotion the workloads across the two AZs and keep the two sites in, um, in, in, uh, in balanced. So this is a good um, uh, stretch cluster uh, continuous availability solution, and it can also be combined with a out-of-the-region disaster recovery, right? Um, so that's actually a good segue um, for me to hand this over to Wen, who will talk about data protection and disaster recovery. Right. Thank you, Shoban. With DR and data protection, I do want to share a story with you. It is a true story. The identity of the customer is removed to protect the innocent. Okay, this was dated back in, guess what that picture resembles? Hurricane. Okay, so back in September of 2005, I was working at VMware as a technical support escalation engineer. And one fine day in September of 2005, I got this critical situation, SEV1, from an end customer. So I really picked up the phone, called the customer, and I quickly found out that the customer's um, in the state of Texas, and they were getting hit by Hurricane Rita, which happened shortly after Hurricane Katrina. Not sure if you all remember. And I quickly found out that the customer needed to evacuate from the data center to prevent the hurricane affecting their production mission-critical virtual machines, in which case I quickly found out that the customer had no DL site, Okay. There's nothing to fail over to. So that's off the list. And then upon another discussion, I asked the customer, do you have backups that you could just yank off from off-site tape location storage that you could restore from? Negative. Now we're left with a situation where we have to evacuate fast in a timely fashion, and there's nothing that we could restore from if we can't evacuate. Then we started to dig deeper into some potential alternatives. And we came up with this one. And yes, that's an external USB device with high capacity SATA devices. Back then, if you remember, SSD, external attached storage, wasn't really a thing. If it was, it was super expensive. And back in the days with ESX2X, I recall, if you remember, there's actually a command to mount the external USB device onto the service console of ESXi and use that as external storage. So we did that, we mounted that thing, and then we used VMKFS tools minus E to export the VMDKs into this wonderful mount. And that worked for a little bit until we discovered the throughput was horrible. It was super slow and it's not gonna work. And guess what? We move on to the next solution, in which case I asked the customer, okay, how many servers do you have and how big are they? And there was, luckily for us, it was only six of them, two EU servers running some JBots that are rated, and the virtual machines are running on a VMFS data store locally attached to servers in a RAID configuration. So what we ended up doing was, customer went into the data center, gracefully shut down the ESXi host, yank off the powers from the uh, power supplies for each server, removed them from the rack, put them in the back of his trunk, and drove off. Fast forward to the ending of the story. Uh, the customer was able to re those servers, power on ESXi, and power on the virtual machines, and back into operation. No data loss. However, they could not run the servers off the back of his trunk for the duration of escaping from the storm. Okay? So now, this was the story. It was a true story. I was the engineer that handled it. Fast forward to today, November 26, 26, right? 2018, we're here in Las Vegas, reInvent, and we got hit by Hurricane Michael. As you can see, we have no control over natural disasters hitting us and causing outages, and human error is one of them as well. What we do have control over is the fact that you can design and deploy a DR solution that can be tested, validated in a repeated fashion with all the trails, as well as backups that can be resided on durable, highly available storage that's also cost effective. So with that said, let's get into it. So customers are telling us, I need to have DR protection right now. And in response to that, a lot of consulting partners, many of you in the audience, actually are coming to us and ask, 
okay, I get a lot of customers asking about using DR with VMware Cloud and AWS. How do I go about doing that and design a solution for the customer? So let's get into it. Before we get into the solutions, let's talk about the customer requirements, shall we? All right, so when we talk to customers with DR sites, we hear mixed feedbacks from uh, the end customers, uh, one of which is the customers just don't want to get in the business of managing data centers, not even colos. They want to have a cloud service that they could provision on demand for DR. And we have another pocket of customers that already have a DR data center that's not quite managed correctly, not with the right level of redundancy and resiliency and the right budget and the right staff to really manage more data centers. And we also have customers that have made investments in data centers long term, and they cannot get out of the data center contract. All in all, we have mixed feedback from customers on what the situations are. And in addition to that, uh, customers have mission critical workloads, like our friend in Texas that are serving their business that need minutes of RPO, recovery point objective, as well as RTO, recovery time objective. And such uh, an application will require immediate uh, switch over, fail over, if you will. And there's also another tier workload that is also production, but they're not mission critical. And these workloads can tolerate RTO and RPO that's much higher in hours. So customers want a solution that works with both kind of workloads in the different tiers. And to top it off, we do have customers that want to have backups they can restore. Right? What's a backup when you can't even restore it? Right? So essentially, customers want cost-effective and highly durable, highly available storage for their backup infrastructure. And it doesn't uh, end there. We do have customers that have invested um, over the years on backup solutions in the partner community. For example, Veeam, Juva, Dell EMC, Conval, Veritas, IBM Spectrum, just to name a few. Customers want these solutions to be compatible, let it be running the workload on-prem, in the cloud, or a combination of both in a hybrid fashion. The compatibility and interop and operational model want to be remain consistent. That's what we were told by the customers. And last but not least, uh, infrastructure automation is a big part of this, especially in a code ER where the compute is not running. Customers do want the ability to have infrastructure as code, to provision infrastructure on demand, and scale infrastructure on demand. So with these requirements in mind, the list, of course, goes on and on, depending on the customer. And we're here to help you as a partner, and we are our partners working with us are here to help you in the customer audience to architect solutions that can cater to these requirements. So with that, let's get into the solution. The first thing we mentioned is with VMware Site Recovery is a service that's an add-on to the base VMware Cloud and AWS service. So what RT and Shoban mentioned, that's the base service where you get the ESX, the VMware Software Defined Data Center stack with ESX, with vSAN, NSX, and vCenter server. Now with Site Recovery is a DR service that is an add-on. So as a customer, you could provision that with a few click of a button. We'll get into what that looks like in a few minutes. Okay, essentially based on the customer requirements, you could design the solution to cater to, for example, if a customer doesn't want to have a new data center, you could spin up VMware Cloud and AWS as the DR site. With the site recovery add-on, you can have vSphere replication to replicate virtual machines, and then do DR orchestration for testing failover, failback through SRM uh, site recovery. And for customers that want to replace their data center, you could spin up a VMware Cloud and AWS cluster in place of the expansion of data center and slowly migrate those workloads in the DR site into the VMware Cloud and AWS cluster as the target. And based on customer feedback, um, our friend uh, at VMware actually added the fan out capability. So for customers that have made big investments in their data center and they can't get out of their data center in any um, timely fashion, then they do have the ability to fan out into a VMware Cloud uh, DR target using uh, site recovery. And last but not least, for customers that want to protect across AWS regions once they have migrated into the cloud, they do have the ability to protect uh, cross-regional uh, capacity running VMware uh, software stack, as well as the ability to replicate from the cloud back to on-premises for DR orchestration. So I think we've done enough uh, PowerPoint slides. Shall we do a demo? Yes? Okay. All right. Uh, no more PowerPoints for now, and let's get into a demo. Okay, so what you he see here is uh, already instantiated uh, VMware Cloud on AWS cluster. So uh, to get into the enablement of the site recovery service, so what we have built here is 
a VMware cloud cluster running in one AWS region to another. So we could do cloud to cloud uh, protection. The key thing here is your operational experience, the usage and the configuration is consistent with all of the use cases I mentioned earlier, okay? So to enable the service, you go into add-on and you just activate by doing that. What that does in the back end is uh, it will orchestrate the installation of the vSphere replication virtual appliance, as well as VMware Site Recovery Manager, register itself as a plugin into vCenter server. So all of that is done for you, very similar to the base service where ESX, vSAN, NSX are all provisioned on behalf of you. So as a customer, you don't have to worry about any of that. And then this component here, download on-premises uh, components. Uh, if you have on-premises vSphere environment, that's what you do. You download another set of binaries, just instantiate those on-premises, pair up the sites, and off you go. So we're doing cloud to cloud, so that's not necessary. Okay, so with that, uh, we just get into the networking aspect. Uh, we do have a firewall uh, visit that is built in with a single click. You could create all the necessary firewall rules, as you can see here, to allow the communication between the sites. So the vSphere replication appliance can communicate, vCenter server can cross-communicate, sub-recovery managers can cross-communicate, okay? And with that, we are now ready to open up the plugin. So I'm gonna log in here. Okay, so I'm gonna log in here and we pair up the sites so the protected site can communicate with the DR site. Okay, we'll select the endpoint here and just type in. Okay, we'll select the two vCenter servers to pair up. And that will just take uh, no time, okay? We'll go into the details. So what site recovery allows you to do is to do the resource mapping. So this network on site A corresponds to that network in site B, right, across the board with networking, with storage, virtual machine folders, okay? So that's essentially what we're gonna do, okay? So we do the network mapping quickly here. Uh, so on here, we just select, let's say, uh, logical network, uh, on one site corresponds to logical network on another site. Uh, so on-prem, this will be a specific port group or distributed virtual port group corresponding to a specific VLAN of choice. We're not, for simplicity, we're not gonna do the reverse. Uh, and SRM does allow you to create a bubble test network that allows you to do non-disruptive production testing of DR. Okay, so we will do that automatically by default. And we'll do quickly uh, some folder mappings to complete the picture here. So we have a workload folder that's interesting to us, uh, which resembles the VMs we want to protect. So we do that and we add the mapping and off we go. Okay, and now resource pool mapping. Compute resource pool on one side, pair up with another compute resource pool on the other side. Okay, uh, we'll do that real quick. Okay. Okay, storage policy, uh, so by mentioned storage policy based management. So you do have the ability to change the storage policy when you do a test recovery or fail over. Okay, so you can go from thin provisioning storage to thick provision and vice versa and change from rate one to rate five is your, uh, that's your requirement. So you could do all of that. And we'll just keep everything as default here. And Last but not least, we have a placeholder data store. This is what uh, some recovery uses to register a shadow virtual machine. So you get the peace of mind that your virtual machines are well protected and register in the destination. And with that, we are now ready to configure protection for the virtual machine that you care the most about. Okay, so VM9 is special to us. So let's protect that one. And we just select the destination data store, which is vSAN. So vSphere replication allows you to select the RPO down to five minutes um, if that's what your business requirements are, okay? And you add a new protection group. 
which resembles the group of virtual machines that will fail over together, okay? And you create a recovery plan, which tells set recovery what to do in the event of a disaster or a test or a fail over or fail back for that matter. Okay, so this will seed the virtual machine and keep it continuously replicated based on the RPO that you have specified. Okay, with the protection group, we are now ready to get into it and specify this is a virtual machine we care the most about. So let's make sure it gets the highest priority when it comes to protection. Yes, let's do that. And we now have the option to configure auto uh, IP customization. If you have a layer two such network like RT mentioned, you don't have to change IP address. Otherwise, you can put in your IP settings for your virtual machines here. Okay, with that, we should be ready to execute a test in which case, it will spin up a writable snapshot in a vSAN data store that's replicated and perform the recovery of the virtual machine. It gets power on and life is good and you clean up after that and you get the ability to export a report out in the uh, HTML format. Uh, it shows you the recovery steps and whether that was successful, okay? So with that, uh, quick demonstration, let's get back into the design of the solution. Okay, based on customer requirements. So the fan out capability was newly introduced. And then we just took, did a quick demo and the consistency and operational experience of the site recovery solution is consistent across all use cases. Now, when we talk to customers, remember we mentioned there's a set of workloads that are uh, tolerant of higher RPO and RTO. So customers really want the best of both worlds using VMware site recovery to do a warm standby, in which case they can just power on the virtual machine when there's a DR or a planned migration. And they do want the ability to protect the, the non-mission critical virtual machines that are also production that can tolerate higher RPO and RTO. So with the mission critical workloads, we have site recovery. Now for these other workloads that could tolerate longer RTO in hours, we do have the ability to leverage the backup solution to ingest data the back of copies of virtual machine into Amazon S3, and then instantiate another instance of the backup software that's running in VMware Cloud and AWS vSphere cluster. And then when DR hits, you use site recovery to recover the mission critical virtual machines like we did earlier. And then you scale out the environment by adding additional ESX servers to your cluster, followed by rehydration of the virtual machine backup that's now residing on S3 into the vSphere cluster. There's no modification, no conversion of virtual machine formats into Amazon machine image. It is basically like to like VM to VM, VMDKs on source, VMDKs in the destination. Okay, now let's get into, so this is a generic architecture, right? it's a backup solution. So let's get into the details on the specific certified solutions that are running on VMware Cloud and AWS, starting with Veeam, okay? So there's three steps here. First step is you instantiate your backup infrastructure with a Veeam and backup replication server that's residing on-prem, okay? With your backup repository, in this case, the AWS Storage Gateway in cache mode. So you could use that to serve the locally uh, backed up virtual machine images, buffer the writes locally, and then ingest the data into Amazon S3. If you have direct connect, then you have a direct connection into the AWS backbone, in which case your data transfer is not over the public internet, okay? And if you don't have DX, not a problem. The storage gateway works equally well over the public internet. The data transfer, it's encrypted. And also on the server side, we leverage S3 server side encryption, so your data is also encrypted at rest. Okay, so now the second step is you will instantiate another instance of the backup and replication server, the data mover, in the cloud side. So in the event of a DR or disaster, then oops, what you do is you leverage SRM as the first step to fail over, and then the second step for this set of workloads that need to be rehydrated. You then provision a new volume from the last recover point of the storage gateway and instantiate a new volume mounted over iSCSI to the Veeam backend replication server and import those backups and restore away, point the restore point into the vCenter server and point that runs in VMware Cloud. Okay, so that's the Veeam solution in a nutshell. One thing I do wanna call out is since we're talking about NSXT, something that's new with NSXT is the communication between the logical network 
running the, in the CGW. Okay? So this is the virtual machine network where your backup software runs on. It has to communicate with vCenter server to invoke the v, VADP API, change block tracking, and all that. So that communication with NSX V, you would have to have an IPsec tunnel between the compute gateway and the management gateway. Customers tell us they don't want to manage yet another tunnel just so they can do backups or performance monitoring with various um, industry uh, integrated solutions. So what we have done with VMware is we allow this communication with a simple enablement in the web portal for VMware Cloud. So your compute gateway can talk to the management gateway over the tier zero, T0, and the XT router. Okay, so that communication is no longer IPsec tunnel you have to establish and maintain just for that communication. It doesn't just apply to data protection solutions, it applies to performance monitoring solutions as well. Anything that needs to talk to vCenter server to invoke API calls, you can enable this communication with a click of a button. Okay, so I do want to call that out. So when you design it, just have that folded into your design for the customers. Now, Dell EMC has released a cloud disaster recovery SaaS solution that can be deployed with VMware Cloud and AWS, uh, complementing VMware site recovery. As a first step, remember, we stand up the backup infrastructure, in this case, data domain along with Avmar, physical or virtual edition. So starting with version 4, we have worked closely with the Dell EMC uh, team to optimize the integration with Amazon S3 so they can write into S3 in the most optimal fashion. So with this release, we now have the ability to deploy it and back up your virtual machines and have them sent to Amazon S3 bucket with built-in compression and deduplication, right? saving the amount of data that you transfer over and back. Okay? So with that in mind, we instantiate another data mover agent called the Cloud Disaster Recovery Agent on the VMware Cloud cluster, very similar to what you saw earlier in the slide and we recover away, right? There's no conversion of any sort, and once you have done the failover, you do have the option to migrate back to on-prem using live vMotion if you have direct connect, or using hybrid cloud extension in bulk if you don't have direct connect. So as a customer, you do have choices. As a consulting partner, when you design it, you based on the customer's requirements and design the right solution using the right two sets. Now moving on to Commvault as another example. You might have seen a pattern already. Step one is you set up your backup infrastructure. In this case, it's CompServe with a media agent that's built in. And you could, of course, deploy media agents as a separate virtual machine and have a scale-out deployment of media agent data movers. Convault has native Amazon S3 integration. It writes to S3 natively. So in this case, you just instantiate the media agent and point it to the bucket, create a policy, and you ingest your data into Amazon S3. Any VMware Cloud side, you instantiate another ComServe or media agent, okay? and in the event of a disaster, you rehydrate into the VMware Cloud cluster and register your virtual machines in the new vCenter server endpoint. Okay, all in all, uh, there's one thing I do want to call out, and that is the deep integration we have with VMware. So with Amazon S3, uh, customers do have a choice. So we have heard from customers that they do not want their backup to run over the public uh, IP space into Amazon S3. For these customers with native AWS, what you would do is you deploy a S3 VPC endpoint, which is a logical construct that will tell us to forward the traffic over our private AWS network. Instead of going out the internet gateway into public IP space, it goes into Amazon S3 through the prefix for Amazon S3. So essentially allowing you to have private communication between your virtual uh, VMware environment with Amazon S3. So with this integration we mentioned, you have the ability to uh, talk over the elastic interface that's attached to each and every ESXi host. And through that, we forward the traffic into the S3 VPC endpoint that's provisioned for your particular environment running native AWS services. So I do want to call that out. The added advantage of using S3 VPC endpoint to access Amazon S3 is the ability to create a bucket level policy to restrict traffic if the source of the originated traffic to S3 is from the S3 VPC endpoint, you can have a policy to only allow that as the traffic, adding another level of security protection for your mission critical virtual machine backups. Okay, and with that, we talked through a lot of these requirements with the DR site investment. VMware site recovery supports all of these use cases from our customers. And warm standby combined with 
the partner community solutions will address the need for a warm standby as well as the backup recovery rehydrating into VMC cluster. We talk about the durable storage for Amazon S3. Uh, customers could use that to ingest data. Uh, and then integrated data protection solutions, we have mentioned a few. And last but not least, there's infrastructure provisioning auto automation. Uh, based on a lot of requests from uh, partners and also customers, the need for automation, uh, we actually uh, finally got approval to uh, release uh, some automation code that's Python-based um, with Lambda step functions um, to provision SDDC on demand. So this is the URL. Uh, we're shortening it, so please go there to uh, clone the Git repository and provision away. So all you need is to enter in your AWS account information, get a token from SDDC so you could do the automation, and you can provision away. And you want to see this in action? Yeah. Okay, right. Let's uh, get into it. Uh, we have, oh, we have a few minutes, uh, enough to do a live demo. Okay, so uh, it's a little bit of latency, switching over to the Live demo. So this is uh, the code repository. So feel free to clone this into your own environment. And we hope you as a partner can take uh, this as the foundation of your practice for DR with VMware Cloud. And if you're a customer and you happen to be a builder or want to become a builder, this is a nice uh, uh, foundational uh, set of scripts that you could invoke to provision SDDCs. OK, so in this environment, I actually have um, provisioned some uh, clusters, uh, like a cooking show. Um, I got some uh, pre-populated ones. What we do is uh, we use the code to provision a new one, OK? Um, to... So as simple as that, uh, we should be able to provision a new cluster. So we have, so we're running a workshop to give you hands-on experience with VMware Cloud, uh, from migration to integrating with native services, with DR, it's happening tomorrow at 8.30. ENT329 is the course. We're repeating it uh, on Wednesday evening, so feel free to register if you haven't done so already. So we have a bunch of single node clusters uh, for a workshop tomorrow. So what you can do is, um, so we'll, we'll create a new one, okay, um, using the code. Um, so um, it's getting provisioned, so uh, we should see a, a new cluster getting spun up, okay? So see, it takes about uh, 90 to 100 minutes-ish uh, to provision a new cluster. So that's all you have to do. And if you um, want to change the firewall settings, we have a way for you to uh, just save your firewall rules to establish VPN tunnels, uh, IPsec tunnels, allow uh, on-prem to communicate. Uh, so when you do DR testing, uh, the single node comes in handy. So you can provision it, deploy it, and then uh, decommission it uh, when you're done, okay? And you can imagine a situation where you can use the code to scale the environment once you're ready to do a DR failover. Uh, all of this come into play, okay? So um, if you want to, uh, so what we can do is um, try to add firewall rules into a pre-provisioned cluster. So you specify, let's say, 21 I provisioned earlier, so fully populated. So use the minus F option in our code to populate the firewall rules. And you should see this getting populated. I want to hide my credentials for tomorrow. Um, so 21 is what we specified, OK? So in here, what this will do is it would create the necessary firewall rules to allow for communication. Uh, see, allow vCenter server, we already added these rules um, as we speak, okay? So by default, you don't get anything that's allowed to access vCenter server. So as simple as the click of a command, we started um, adding these uh, rules, requesting uh, Elastic IP so we can do NAT configurations and all that. So uh, feel free to contribute to this um, and use that to your advantage as a partner, build practices around it for DR. And as a customer, uh, play around with the provisioning aspect. It's very simple. You just have to enter in the proper credentials, and you provision away. Okay, and uh, that's 
um, a quick demo. And to wrap up, um, we do want to stay around for Q&A to answer all your questions that you might have. And in summary, we talk about many two boxes. Right? One of them is on-prem, and the other one is the cloud. And in between the boxes, we draw a line. And that resembles laying a solid network foundation using AWS Direct Connect with NSXT, private hosted virtual interface. So we can have this live beam motion migration of virtual machines on-prem into the cloud. And then we talked about NSXT, the difference between V and T, okay? where you have the BGP support, DPDK, and using NSX uh, T0 router for termination of IPsec tunnels for both management and compute uh, network. We have private hosted virtual interface. That's a single interface that allows you to have live migration of virtual machines without having to have a layer three IPsec tunnel as well as a layer two um, tunnel across from uh, on-prem to the cloud. Soban talked about the Elastic vSAN, which is EBS back vSAN, as well as i3, uh, and also uh, Amazon S3 storage gateway and Amazon EFS. I'm not sure if you saw the announcement this morning. Uh, Jeff Barr wrote a blog post about data sync. It's a new service that we couldn't really talk about until today. So pretty excited to have that service announced. It's essentially another way for you as a customer to move data from on-prem into the cloud. We have from a lot of customers, they leverage the file gateway in particular for Oracle database backups into the cloud. So the gateway can ingest data into S3. So this is another option in which case, if you're already placing your backup in a sheer NFS export on-prem, it's just a matter of deploying the agent, which is a virtual appliance that runs on ESXi. You mount that NFS export and let us take care of the rest in terms of security and IAM integration, writing the S3 in the most optimal fashion, or Amazon Elastic File System. And that's another option for you to ingest data really fast into the cloud. And with the VMware Cloud solution, you can just get those data really fast because you are in the same AWS infrastructure. You mount EFS here, or you can access S3 over VPC endpoint and restore your backups. Okay, so data sync, look it up. It's a pretty exciting service. We're gonna do some deployments and write some blog posts so you could uh, learn more about it. And I just went through the solution of using VMware Site Recovery in conjunction with partner integrated solutions that allows customers to have the ability to have warm standby orchestrated through Site Recovery Manager as well as the rehydration using partner integrated solutions that back up into Amazon S3 or EFS for that matter. Okay, and last but not least, we have code out in GitHub that you could just clone into your local development environment and start becoming a builder, do some infrastructure automation and automate away. And with that, that's a quick summary and we are here for you to ask any questions you might have. And yeah, like I said, this is the last session in this room so we could stay for as long as your heart desires. With that, any questions? Oh, sorry. Uh, the, the question was, what's the workshop that we're running tomorrow that features uh, some hands-on experience with this service? ENT329. Yeah, tomorrow, 8.30 a.m. Uh, repeat as Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. in the evening, so we could geek out on a Wednesday evening and Tuesday morning. And question. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, how EBS is presented to ESXi? Ah, okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, question was, uh, how, how is EBS presented to uh, EC2 running ESXi? Uh, that's very much similar to how you would mount EBS volumes today. You attach an EBS volume into EC2. The difference is the virtual machines will not access the EBS volumes like you do with EC2. The EBS volumes will serve as the devices that will create the vSAN disk groups. So vSAN will turn that into the single namespace vSAN data store. Okay, so you have your caching tier, capacity tier, those are all backed by EBS volumes. So is that, is that like an ice mount? Is ah, yeah, so is that an iSCSI mount? Uh, it's not quite iSCSI. I can't talk about the mechanism that we use to mount. Essentially, it shows up as an NVMe device on ESXi and it's, uh, yeah, another namespace in NVMe that uh, vSAN just take advantage of. The VMDKs will be placed in the abstracted logical namespace, vSAN data store. Yeah, it's not VMFS. Yeah, it's not VMFS on EBS, right? It's vSAN on EBS, okay? So we have the disk groups that are created out of these EBS volumes. And the EBS volumes, in case you were wondering, is the general purpose two GP2 SSD volumes for high performance. So we want customers to have 
huge amount of capacity as well as good performance. Okay. Ah, okay. Another question on is it Ethernet connectivity or is it fiber channel? Um, I can tell you it's uh, a dedicated network interface that's attached to the EC2 host to have EBS optimized access. All right, great questions. Thank you. Question there. Ah, okay. So the question was on uh, the performance between uh, the locally attached NVMe devices and uh, EBS attached over the network. Uh, uh, my buddy Peng actually uh, did some performance uh, testing on the cluster. They actually uh, are very comparable in terms of performance. I forgot off the top of my head what the performance delta was, but uh, it was actually very close in terms of uh, OLTP transactional workloads. Um, yeah, because uh, like I mentioned, it's not sharing the ENA that's attached for virtual machine traffic. It's a dedicated ENA that is used for EBS um, service. So very similar to an EBS optimized instance that you uh, provision in AWS proper. So you get the EBS uh, dedicated throughput. So. Yes, I mean, you go over the network, you get additional latency, but um, it's comparable performance. Yeah, if you stay a little bit longer, I can dig up that uh, talk and send it to you. Questions, additional questions? Networking, data protection, DR. Ah, another question, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think with um, a lot of the edge services, um, we do have customers that would migrate their internet-facing workloads to the cloud, um, in which case they would then just take advantage of um, the elastic load balancing, right? Using the ALB with the target group uh, that use, uh, that's consisted of uh, virtual machines that are running uh, on ESX as, as opposed to EC2 instances, in which case um, they could just leverage a service that's highly available, uh, that's regional from AWS and get away from having to you know, provision, let's say, these virtual appliances that are serving as ELBs in, in, another, um, in the VMware cluster. So just take advantage of these edge services combined with Route 53 and web application firewall and shield to have layers of security protection, right? So it comes in with DNS routing and then into um, your shield to monitor for DDoS attacks and then WAF to have layer seven uh, application uh, firewalling. And before the you know, the traffic hits your virtual machines, you get that resilient um, service that you consume. Right? So um, that's what some of our customers are doing with their web applications, really to take advantage of our native edge services. Right? Would that be consumed, though, on demand for the actual administration of DR, or would that be provisioned ahead of time? Yeah, so uh, it, it, you're going to provision that ahead of time, right? or you could use uh, CloudFormation to orchestrate the automation. Uh, it's really a customer choice. Um, what I've seen most customers do is really, they have migrated over, they just start using that as the primary, okay, and just call it done and configure it once and just leave it and let it consume the edge services. But thanks for that uh, question. Yeah, uh, so the way it works is pretty much universal. Um, let's say uh, you have your, so most of these solutions, they have a, a proxy, if you will, a data mover that will point to a backup repository, okay? So if you use a storage gateway, some of the backup repository will be iSCSI volume that's attached to um, the virtual machine that's running that backup software. So um, that backup repository could be backed by you know, some cheap and deep storage on-prem, or it could be backed by Amazon S3 storage gateway uh, that's funded with a POSIX compliant file system. So essentially, your backup software know nothing about the data being in S3. What they see is a volume. Right, through the storage gateway, in which case they import the backups. Yeah, so I guess the question is more of how then do you deploy it? Because if you're VMC, if someone locks down, like, you don't have access. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was, you know, if VMC is locked down because it's run as a service. Um, so if you're talking about these journal-based uh, you know, uh, replication, let's say uh, Zerto, for example, uh, then that doesn't get installed on ESX as a user world application through VIP. Uh, so those solutions are not yet compatible. But for the typical 
rehydration where you restore import backup from a backup repository, then you just import that backup and then you point to vCenter server. I mentioned with NSXV, you could establish the communication from a virtual machine logical network with the management overlay where vCenter server runs. So through that IPsec tunnel, right, from the compute gateway into the management gateway, you can talk to vCenter server. And the firewall rule wizard actually opens up uh, ESX port 902 for most backup uh, configurations to run. So it invokes this hot app, uh, VADP API, right, to hot attach the virtual machine without talking directly to v uh, ESXi server. So you mount the snapshot, for example, of the virtual machine into the uh, data mover virtual machine itself and start copying right over um, the storage stack within ESX. Um, yeah, so uh, with the native uh, S3 integrated solution like Commvault, they just talk uh, right to S3 natively. So you just point to Amazon S3 bucket once you fail over or when you want to restore into the cloud. So that's uh, more straightforward than to having to fund it by a storage gateway, for example, right? Because S3 is not POSIX compliant, it's not a file system, it's a web-based object store. So storage gateway serves uh, the POSIX compliant file system into the virtual machines. So you just abstract that uh, object storage in the back end. So um, thank you for that. Uh, anything else we can answer for you? All right, uh, you're still here, and we're here till uh, midnight, and uh, feel free to come up and ask questions.